Yeah. Oh, seeing it. There it is. There we go. Yeah. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Persuasion by the Pint. I'm Jonathan Taylor, along with Sean McCool. Uh, episode 304. We have a special guest this week, Jonathan. Yes, we have. Uh, we're going to be talking, uh, discussing how to tell good stories with AI um, from a gentleman named Brian Hennessy. I love that name, by the way. I think there's a was there a, Hennessy a whiskey. whiskey out there? There is a whiskey. Good. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a whiskey for sure. So we'll ask him when he comes on. Well, might as well just bring him on, right? You got a little well. bio or anything you want to do? Or you just yeah, absolutely. Let me bring it up here. I'm so well prepared as we as we as talk. we always are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have, uh, again, Brian Hennessy is the CEO and co-founder of Talkoot. I think I've got that pronounced right. Talkoot helps uh, brands like Adidas, Burton, um, uh, Herschel, Donner, and many others uh, build a creator, uh, creator, create deeper connections with customers on every product page through a deeper product storytelling. Um, prior we're going to get, to, we're gonna have to get AI to start reading for you. <laughs> I think it's my eyes, man. Um, prior to Talkoot, Brian was the global writing director at Adidas. Uh, then he went on to um, start uh, ThreadCreative.com, a, a story studio that helps great companies find their story and use it to create better products. So it'd be interesting to um, hear from Brian just how they're using AI within their company um, to you know, create product descriptions for companies and their clients. Um, yeah. I mean, I've, I've gone through the web page, their, their sub site and it's not cheap for companies to jump on board. So I think it's pretty, uh, yeah, pretty cool what got, they're doing. Yeah. Okay, when you got thousands of SKUs, I mean, yeah, it's, you need a service like this. So we'll learn more about that, but yeah, let's go ahead and bring him on with a nice round of applause. All right, Brian, welcome to the show. Ooh. Well, thank you for having me on. Yeah, we're excited to talk about this. We're, <laughs> yeah. we're kind of excited about all things AI right now. Just like, you know, the the newness of it, the uncertainty of it. It's all a little little fascinating right now. And uh, moving a, faster than any, you know, even the internet and app culture. It's wild. It is like uh, being a part of it. It's like being in a rock tumbler, like every day. <laughs> Yeah. There's something new. You wake up and it's like, oh, somebody just launched this. Oh, this happened. You're like, oh my God. Okay. Well, that yeah. used to be that, that used to be how we used to differentiate ourselves. Now we sure. have to like think about something else. So Yeah. And those things used to pop up what every six months or a year. Now they're popping up, like you said, every 24 oh, hours. Yeah. yeah. It's really like you go to, you know, you wake up in the morning and I'm looking at my phone in the morning. And I'm like, oh shit. Okay. <laughs> I've got a meeting with somebody in two hours and I got to figure this out because they're going to ask me about this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah. We'll get into that. We'll get into kind of what you're doing and what you're seeing, um, power of storytelling, mm -hmm. all that stuff. But first, before we do that, uh, let's get into some beverages. So Brian, right. you brought on a beverage. You've got a yes. here. Tell us a little bit about it and I why show you choose it here. That it is a soft IP India soft India pale ale from uh, Kings and Daughters. It's a little brewery out here in Oregon, but it is uh, being it is a very influential brewery. Uh, it's one guy and his wife. It's Kyle and Casey, but uh, Kyle is a insanely cr uh, creative brewer, and he's doing collabs with a whole bunch of breweries out here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, just because he's in such demand. So it is amazing. And the great thing, I'm a dad and it's like dad level alcohol. Like, <laughs> they have a really great tasting IPA at like 4.8 uh, ABV. Sure. I'm, I'm right there. <laughs> cool. So is that is that what the soft indicates is the low alcohol or is it something else that makes it a soft? I haven't heard the term soft. IPA I know. Before. Well, no, he, he coined it. And I would say it is... Um, it's both the taste and the alcohol level. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very cool. It's interesting. 4%. Nice yeah. That's, 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 that's light soft. on this show. Yeah. All right. Totally. <laughs> we'll give you a break. We're usually, uh, you know, 8% is kind of low for us. Uh, right. Lately. You know. 
Yeah. Well, you're, you are three hours ahead, uh, behind us. So <laughs> exactly. That's why I'm doing this one. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Perfect. I still, I still have to go to the gym today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jonathan, what do you have? Uh, so I have from uh high wire, uh, another 10 W 40 series called chocolate taco. <laughs> nice. So uh, I love 10 W 40, man. Their stuff is so good. They, yeah, they come up with some really creative stuff. Um, this is an imperial stout brewed with uh, chocolate, vanilla, mm. and lactose. Um, taco beer. So I'm not sure what a taco beer is supposed it's to taste like. It's a chocolate taco, right? It's a chocolate taco, yeah. Yeah, so, so the ice cream snack. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's, it's, that should be pretty good. It, it better be. It'd, be. Um, it'd be hard to screw that up, I would think, but who knows? 8% ABV. Um, only... 20 IBUs. So here we yeah. go. It's pretty dark. It's pretty light. So. Yeah, that is pretty dark. Well, I would expect that from a chocolate taco. So <laughs> um, I went a little different route today. Literally, I've not left the house this week. I think I went on one walk, but it's been kind of cold and rainy in Austin, which is great because we've needed it. Mm-hmm. I did not want to go to the store. I was out of beer. So I mixed up a cocktail. Okay. Um, I've got, so I took the um, coffee whiskey coffee oh, flavored yeah. whiskey that they, I've had uh, and I so added a little uh, Irish cream to it okay for a little right. uh, coffee kind of an Irish coffee but with a little you know it's basically an Irish coffee mm-hmm. kind of half pre-mixed so that's what I've got today it's not hot but cold in my uh rocks and roll glass <laughs> for whiskey so yeah is this the Ellington Reserve the uh, yes. cold brew okay yes. yep. <laughs> I've been looking for that it. can't yeah. find it I can't find it so yeah any, I think, coffee flavored whiskey would be good. Uh, yeah, I've tried a couple; they're both they're good. So, mm-hmm. all right, well, let's uh, cheers it up, and then we'll give them a quick rating, and we'll move on. So, cheers. cheers, cheers. Mm. Brian, we always let our guests go first. Sean, as Sean mentioned earlier, it's a one to five pints. We rarely give a five pint score on our mm-hmm. show. So you can use decimals if you want, but you can't <laughs> as many as you want. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give this a four pinter because of the ability of it to deliver the taste at the alcohol level. Nice. Okay. It- mm. Very cool. <clears throat> That's Jonathan. challenging for a lot of beers, especially those yeah. <clears throat> those lower, you know, alcohol uh, beers. You know. Yeah, light beers are having some challenges right now. At least one. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of stories, we'll get yeah. into that. <laughs> we'll get into that. Um, yes, that's cool. So, Jonathan, what do you rate your uh, chocolate taco ten forty combo? This is amazing. I mean, you have a four nine. It is wow. so good. Ooh. Very smooth. Um, they make a good beer. They make a great beer. It very smooth aftertaste. Um, yeah, not too sweet at all. Eight percent. That's it's a perfect beer. So yeah. almost I can't give it a five because I just I don't feel right giving a five. You know, we we did we've given one five, Brian, um, this year. You know, and it was wow. really good. And uh, I I don't want to give too many of those, but uh, this is this is close to a five, about as close as you can get. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah i'm gonna go about the same rate i'm gonna go 4.9 also okay this is my go-to cocktail mm-hmm. um for like evenings and you know cool days and things like that it's it's rich you know it's got the, the coffee the whiskey the irish cream um so good and uh so yeah i'll give it a four nine um for that reason i will warn our listeners never order this in a in a restaurant or a bar. Okay. Because they, it's basically like two full, uh, drinks. So they charge you like double the rate of a drink because okay. the whiskey and the Irish cream is basically each its own drink. Mm-hmm. So they, I got, I remember I ordered it one time. It was like 22 bucks at mm-hmm. the hotel bar. Uh, right. So yeah, don't, don't buy those at the hotel bar. So, Oof. um, but yeah, it's good stuff. Good tip. <laughs> Four, nine. That's good. Yeah, awesome. it's two four nine. My go to go to. Yeah. You could also add a splash of Kahlua in there if you want to just take it over Very the top. Very nice. <laughs> All right. Well, Brian, I'm excited. Uh, I got to know though. Yeah. Start, starting off, 
what the heck is a talkout or where did the name come from? It's uh, it's Finnish actually. It's basically a, uh, a, a barn raising. Like if you're going to have your community come together and do something like, you know, back in the day you'd go oh. and till the fields or do whatever as a community. It's, mm-hmm. it's called a talkout. Very cool. So is that how yeah. you say it? Is that how you say it? A talkout? Is that how you say your business name or is it? Yeah. Talkout. Okay. Very cool. I mean, I don't know if that's true, if it's real. That's how I say it. Okay. <laughs> the nice thing is you can't really mess it up. Like, I don't care if you're like talkout or talkout or however it is. It all works. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So you even got a story behind your uh, brand. There with the name. <laughs> that's, that's every, I mean, honestly, that's what, uh, you know, back when I started my writing studio, I actually, the, the tabletops, which I'm at right now are from a bowling alley. They're, the, they're actually the, uh, the floor of a bolt 1953 bowling alley. And I was like, everything that in this thing has to have a story and it all has to get back that's to creativity. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So I know your background, you spent, yeah. your, <clears throat> your, uh, you were a creative writer for Adidas for a period of time, right? I mean, I uh, was their director, and actually, creative writing director. Yeah. You were talking about, uh, the air, air the air <laughs> movie. I actually, uh, Peter Moore from, I think he actually makes a, uh, shows up as a minor character in that movie, but he was the design, the head of design. He designed, um, the air first air Jordans. He was my yeah. boss. Yeah. Oh, very cool. He was my boss at uh, That's Adidas. That's crazy. When no, I, he, I mean, he had a pretty significant role. I mean, oh yeah. Not at the first part of the movie, but like, you know, halfway through the movie, you see him quite a few times throughout the movie as they're, you know, designing the shoe. So, oh yeah. Like I lived and breathed that, like he had just moved over and be, and started Adidas and right. I was the number two copywriter that he hired. That is so cool. So did, was he at Adidas before or after the Air Jordan? After. So yeah. he, he and Rob Strasser left uh, Nike started their own consulting company, Adidas tapped them. And then Adidas ended up buying their company and turning it into Adidas America. Okay. And that's where I, that's where I got my job. Adidas was in a warehouse in like industrial Portland and it was like 150 people. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, no, that's, uh, that's kind of the tennis shoe mech up there for a while, huh? Oh, it is like there's keen, there's, I mean, you, you kind of, there's Under Armour here. Now you kind of have to either be in Boston or uh, Portland if you want to be in the shoe industry. Yeah. Interesting. It's funny how in the movie it, it was between, you know, it was all Nike, Converse and Adidas. Of course you don't hear Converse. <laughs> Converse is not really a, a huge uh, brand anymore. I yeah. So they're, like kind of, they're, still, they're kind of big in fashion now. More, yeah. They're more of a fashion shoe now than they are a tennis shoe. Yeah, I totally. think so. yeah, absolutely. And you know, M- Nike bought them out, so you know, it was uh it's just it's it's kind of amazing because it's a great movie, but you also learn a lot of history. Um yeah. You know, in the movie, which um I would assume is mostly accurate. I haven't fact-checked everything, but it it's it's a great story. So Yeah, I haven't uh, I haven't watched it, but uh yeah. like I've met Sonny Vaccaro. We had to do pitches like we I worked on the uh Kobe pitch originally yeah. when Adidas won Kobe. Wow. Um, and Sonny would come in and like we'd have to get, yeah. present to him the pitch and things. It was sure. It's, so it's it is weird seeing that stuff and being like, <laughs> "Oh my god, yeah, I was part of that. I remember that." That's person. crazy. Oh man, that's awesome. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, tell us um tell us Brian about um the storytelling AI product yeah. storytelling is what it says on your website. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, the tag, the subhead is um, produce on brand search optimized product descriptions across every channel, increasing traffic, conversion rates, and sales. So, first of all, what is product storytelling? Because that's something <clears throat> we haven't, we've talked a lot about using stories and email, yeah. using stories, and but I'm not, I have not heard the phrase product storytelling. So, tell us a little yeah. what that means. Yeah, it's basically what, like, if you think about it, um, the way I, I talk about it, and again, I'm going to throw out some, you know, nerdy terms here, but inbound product storytelling, any more brands, like, you know, going back to say what you're talking about, Nike, mm-hmm. um, Nike, bef- before Nike, um, if you think of like VW, VW in the 60s was, you know, did amazing stuff. But if you look at what VW was all about, it's about product. They did an amazing job 
their their ads like it was like it's almost like a product page their ads you know from the 60s vw like it was just great product storytelling it wasn't about like some other thing like nike was all about you know winning and like they would all their ads they were famous for like not even having products in their ads right mm -hmm. so nike taught us to be about brands and so everyone became about branding but now no one cares about brands. Your brand is basically like, what have you done for me lately? What amazing product have you done, you know, built right now sure. that solves a problem in my life? And right. so now it's going back to let's talk about products again, only let's talk about them in interesting ways. And let's, you know, tell stories about them and how they fit into our lives versus mm -hmm. talking about the benefits and features. And so, you know, I come from Adidas was the engineering kind of you know whereas Adi uh, nike was always aspirational and talked about the brand adidas was always about the product and i was like you know when i worked there i'm like let's stop talking about like the features and benefits and start talking about like people's lives and how our products fit into their lives was that from the uh it's adidas is german right yeah yes totally <laughs> so that's where that probably comes from is the, mm -hmm. yeah. the german ethic and the you know yep. the engineering and all that absolutely yeah. So, I mean, like, instead of talking about the product, talk about the person's life and how it actually fits into their life and like the story about like how you solved a problem for them. Sure. And so, so there's, that? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead and continue your thought. That's that. Like, I mean, just, you know, talk about taking hike or talk about, um, you know, taking a ride on your snowboard or whatever it is. And mm -hmm. then, you know, the problems that you have and talk in their language, talk in people's language, like you talk about, you know, people talk about snowboarding with their friends all the time and they don't talk like brands talk about snowboarding. Right. They tell yep. stories. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like you say, for instance, oh, I got this new, new snowboard and they're like, oh, what's it like? Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, it's like, and then you tell a story about what it's like to ride on that, ride that snowboard. Yeah. When you're a brand, you're like, oh, the VS24, you know, flexo groove improves performance on the ride and you're like that's not how people talk we tell yeah. stories about stuff <laughs> seems yeah. like uh the golf ball industry could take a few lessons big time oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, right i mean the golf club what... and golf golf ball i mean this week's master's week as we're mm -hmm. recording this so yeah. um yeah I see all these golf commercials on you know and uh, yeah it's all the it's the all carbon, features the yep. carbon technology you know yeah. all this stuff that uh Nobody cares about really. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Nobody cares. I yeah. mean, I spent, I spent years, like after I had left Adidas, I started my own like story studio mm -hmm. and I would just go around from company to company and go like, nobody cares about your technology. Stop it. Hmm. It got, it got yeah. to be oh, almost a little, I almost got burned out because mm -hmm. every engage, you know, every time I'd have a new client, I'd be like, okay, stop talking about technology. Start telling stories about people's lives and how you're, Sure. Problem solve, you know, your, your things just talk about, talk like a human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you bring the technology in at some point? I mean, you know, there's, there's the idea yeah. of a unique mechanism mm -hmm. in copy, but that usually, I know when I write long form copy, the unique mechanism shows up late in the copy, right? When you, once you introduce the product, but yeah, so totally. you, still, you still use that, but you're, you're saying lead with storytelling where these people are leading with their technology or features yeah. <clears throat> it's the proof right it's the proof point at the end right like it should be the period at the end you should be talking about your your product or the feature or the technology right at the end you're like and that's why we created this and then people are like whoa that makes so much sense yeah you're like Very you know nice. how um you know when you do this thing and then that happens isn't that frustrating they're like yes it's totally frustrating well, here's the thing. Here's what makes it frustrating. And then you tell them about what makes it frustrating. You're like, oh, I didn't even know that that, was, that, it, that happened. You're like, yeah. And that's why we solved it. And they're like, whoa, that's super interesting that you solved right. that thing. I didn't even know why you did that. That's an interesting story. That's product storytelling instead of just leading with the thing. Would you say this is similar to going back, you know, 10 or 12 years now, uh, maybe longer to Simon Sinek and his golden circle yeah, he, he did that famous example with Apple and he kind of went out and then back, you know, in totally. That's, that's it's interesting. Yeah. Like um, the funny thing is, is that when he did that, I actually uh, came up with this thing for our customers and um, it's, it's actually 
kind of similar, but it's different. Like there's the whole, you know, why at the middle. He right. said it's about the why. And actually when you are talking, there's kind of um, like people that are influential. There's like this uh, way that stories are organized that you don't even like people don't recognize. And that in the center of the story is a belief. And it's kind of this, it, that's the thing you shouldn't talk about. It's like when you went, lots of brands, you know, you go to the website and it's like, we believe that blah, blah, blah. And again, if you walked into, if like humans don't talk like that, when you go into a, you know, a party mm -hmm. and you're like, hey, this is, um, you know, this is Jonathan. I'd like you to meet Sean. Sean, this is Jonathan. Like, oh, thanks, Sean. Nice to meet you. You know, Sean, I believe that he's like, no. <laughs> What we like to talk about are the little things, but we like right. to bake our beliefs into, like when I talk to you, when you, I start talking to you, I'll talk about the desks at my thing. I'll talk about all the little stuff in our lives, but all the stories I tell point to big beliefs about what I believe about life. Mm -hmm. That seems very nuanced. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and knowing copy and things like that, it's... It sounds simple, but it, I, I know from experience, it's, it's not easy to pull off. Totally. And that's the, that's kind of what the store, like our story studio did instead of just a writing studio, we'd actually help brands figure out how to like live a story so that we could tell better stories about what they're doing. And that's like a Patagonia. Like you look at a, in, in Nike, especially you look mm -hmm. at Nike and like they operate where under there's a, like part of storytelling is the, there's a frame and it's basically a frames are like big fat metaphors we think in. Yeah. Like we think that up is good. Everybody in the world thinks that up is good. It's not because up is good. It's because our moms picked us up and our dads picked us up. Anytime we had a problem as a baby, we get picked up and fed and that made us happy. And we got set down. We wet our diaper. My, our parents would pick us up, change the diaper, set us down. And so the synapse in our head that contains the idea of up grew together with the idea of good so that the stock market goes up when it's going good. Everything is up. I feel up when I feel good. And so our thinking, our brains are basically metaphor machines. And right. so sport, for instance, like I'll go back to Nike and Adidas in sport, we have this dominant frame, which is sport is war. It's conflict. I have, if I win, you have to lose. Sure. And that's, that's kind of like <clears throat> how NFL films and Nike have framed sport for us. Like mm. it's about war. It's about lieutenants and generals and machines and things. And the thing is, is that that's just a frame. Like there's other frames. And so for instance, with Adidas about 15, in about 2015, I was like, well, why does sport have to be about war and why is there winners and losers? Like I'll take a trail, I'll go on a trail run at the mid, you know, at lunch and I'm there to like disconnect and like, it's almost like meditation. Like I use sport to grow. You can sure. use sport to like be creative and so you can change. And so like all the stories you tell, if I believe that sport is about creativity and exploration, I don't use guns as a metaphor. I don't talk about lieutenants. I don't, I don't frame things as a war. Yeah, right. And so that's what we help brands do is like we used to help we, our, the agency still does help brands like understand what the dominant frame is in your industry and then change that frame for you. That's very interesting. How do you how do you find, you know, because I mean, I'd never thought about mm -hmm. I'm like, what's the old what's the memes of the channel like today years old? Like I'm today years old with the whole up analogy. I never put that together. That's, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, for a metaphor. So how do you, how do you find or spot? The, Cause the, if it's a frame, it's, it's like fish and water, right? It's, it's just it's there. Totally. So that's the thing. You, how do you pull it out? That's really hard. That's the hard part is you have to start. And that's actually leading right into AI. That's, what's amazing about like chat GPT, chat GPT or GPT, technology in general, anything by open AI, it's boring. At, like if you want to use it as a writer, it's boring. It's made to be boring. It's terrible. Don't use it as a finished product <laughs> in writing. Yeah, but right. what you want to do 
is like to, to understand like what, how people communicate within an industry, I would have to do tons of research. And that's where this is like chat GPT is amazing. It's when it comes to like having ideas and uh, kind of researching and validating those ideas. So you're like, well, how do people talk about fishing? How do people talk about food? And you, I'd have to, I'd have to pour over websites. I'd have to like just do a ton of mm. research with now I can go on a chat GPT and say like, how do people talk about food? And it, and it spits out thing. And I'm like, give me some references where you so found that. What would be a prompt for that? I'm just curious. What would be a uh, more or less a prompt that you would use? for Try asking? this. Well, Sean's going to do it right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, give me a chance to use chat GPT. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> so I know we've used it before. Do you say, is it, is it as simple as how do people talk about X, Y, Z? Or do you say pretend or think of myself as a fisherman or think of yeah. myself as, you know, I often, what I do is um, I often ask it about cliches because cliches are the things that have become so okay. baked into culture yeah. that we don't even think about it. And so I often talk about cliches. So I, I do say, I'll say like, th tell me some metaphors that people use about fishing. Give me okay. some metaphors people use about food. Okay. And then I'll say, what are some cliches about food? And then all of a sudden I'll be reading that. And I'm like, ah, there, right there, there's sure. a cliche that, and then I'll validate that and I'll go around and collect a whole bunch of kind of um, different, you know, places where that shows up. Mm -hmm. and, then I, and then I'm like, okay, I'll go to, you know, the, the, the leading brands website and find examples. And I'll be like, Oh, look at that. That's interesting. Wow. That, that's <clears throat> so you're you're completely coming from a different uh, angle than I thought you would be. So I, I love how you're using that, you know, just from understanding mm -hmm. the industry that you're working with. There's the always terminology yeah. and the, you know, the words they use to describe their industry. You know, I'm I'm in a very technical industry that I am in sales and marketing with. And it's very um, it's full of uh some of the same jargon that everybody uses and that's mm -hmm. what's sometimes frustrating. And it's very much uh, features and benefits with most of the companies in our, in the industry that I'm in. Yeah. Uh, and that's how they describe themselves. They don't use, they don't tell stories at all. <laughs> that's like, I've been harping on this for the longest time is that, you know, they're, they're still using, you know, features and benefits like Sean said with the golf ball. Um, and it's, you know, we're in 2023 and they haven't learned that, you know, it's, it's, it's all about the storytelling. So, right. So storytelling, actually, like if you really look into it, storytelling is actually how we change people's beliefs, how we change our own belief. It's actually yeah. how we hold beliefs. Sure. So there's a thing called our, um, our narrative identity. Mm -hmm. Like we all have a narrative identity and we, it came about through like experiencing our life. And so this narrative identity, like our lives, independent of if we didn't have this brain that filtered everything into a story, uh, life is insanely more random than we want to believe, but our brain makes it seem like it makes sense the way it does that it, by creating mm -hmm. stories. Yeah. And so I say, tell, you know, Sean, tell me about yourself. You're going to tell me stories, the reason why you tell stories to tell about yourself and not bullet points in a PowerPoint presentation is because story is our, how we, our brains make sense of life. It's our, it's our operating system. Right. So if people, if someone doesn't tell you a story about a fact, you actually have to build a story yourself in your head about mm -hmm. that fact so you can remember it. Right. And so we hold our beliefs in our stories. Mm -hmm. It's right. like the jello mold within which we hold our lemon slices or, or orange slices of beliefs. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That brings up so many questions. Um, I guess, and most people don't realize kind of like we said earlier, most people don't realize that they're they're that they have this narrative identity. I would assume. It's exactly right. It's all like you were saying, it's all the water that we swim in. Yeah. And so when you tell someone that's, you know, in the world of sports, sport is war, or, or like we, 
uh, one of the companies we work with uh, in the writing studio is Tofurky, and they make vegetarian food. And you're like, well, how do people, how do most brands talk about vegetarian food? And it's about, um, it's a sacrifice. Food is a sacrifice. Like I have to eat this food because I believe I need to save the animals or I need to save earth. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what a crappy thing to do. Like put sacrifice, like sacrifice. Yeah. 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 That, that brings up all kinds of pictures. I mean, it feels like pain and, yeah. uh, you know, stress. discomfort and stress you're, and you're trying to sell people on right. your food and you're saying right. like, well, it's not enjoyable, right. but it will save the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's that whole idea of, um, it's much harder to sell against something than it is for something. <clears throat> right. 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 Well, what you find is, is in current, in what, like the reason the, why the dominant frame is the dominant frame is because most people believe that this is true, but in every, like when you're a challenger brand, like if you want, if you're a small brand and you need to become a big brand, you need to have a, an alternative that for people who aren't happy with what, are, with what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, what, you know, what I always ask people is, um, what do you love? Like, what brand do you love? Mm -hmm. And you say like, for instance, Nike, uh, you know, uh, people love Nike. And then you're like, well, what do you hate about Nike? Like what bugs the hell out of you about Nike? Mm -hmm. And when I look at like, when I, when we kind of did our, um, reframing of sport for, for Adidas, I would say like, I look at the Nike products and I'm like, I think those are cool looking. Like I like the Nike products, they do a great uh, design. Like yeah. there's a lot of Nike products where I'm like, well, that's actually really, you know, that's a great looking design. I love that. Sure. But what I hated about Nike is the whole idea of winning takes care of everything. There's a headline from Ti a Tiger Woods ad and it says winning takes care of everything. Yeah. I hate that idea. <laughs> I hate, and when you talk to people, like I know a lot of people that work at Nike and they're like, yeah, it's all about sport is war. And like, we even compete against each other. It's sure. all about conflict and war and that. And I'm like, I, I hate that. Yeah. yeah. And I believe that winning does not take care of everything. I will not wear a shoe that believes that winning takes care of everything. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's also, it, it reminds me kind of what you said about, um, like going on a trail run versus sport is war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reminds me a lot again of, um, I guess I'm on a Simon Sinek kick for today for some reason, but the whole, I guess it wasn't his original idea, but the infinite versus finite games. Yes. Mm -hmm. Trail running would be a finite game. I mean, yeah. an infinite game and you know, yeah. a football game is a finite game. Totally. And, and it seems like Nike's on the, on the finite side of things. Right. Um, and Can't win forever. So if, so if I, so <laughs> Following your idea there, you, if I wanted to be a challenger brand to Nike, how would I take that something that you don't like and use that? I think that's where you were going. Yeah. Yeah. So with Adidas, for instance, and this gets, actually gets into the AI for Adidas, what we did is re we reframed their narrative and we said, okay, it's not about conflict and war. It's always about uh, exploration and discovery and creativity. So the, the, and when they look, when you look right now at the, um, collaborations that Adidas puts together or the, uh, the athletes they sponsor. Um, it's all like athletes who are creative versus, you know, winning takes care of everything, dominant athletes, people who have changed the game. Like Lionel Messi is a good example. Like he was really small because he had a, uh, what was it? Some sort of glandular problem. Mm -hmm. And so because he was small, much smaller than most that he had to reinvent, he had to totally reinvent the, the game of soccer for himself or football, as sure. they say. And so he has this whole different game and people were like, I can't figure this out. I can't figure out how he's playing because everybody else, because they only recruited large players who like could dominate in certain ways were fast or whatever. He changed it because he had to reinvent soccer for himself. So sure. like we, if you look, so getting back to like the AI, the difference, like when we talk about chat GPT or GPT four, whatever it's trained on the whole of the internet and the whole of the internet is mostly boring. Yeah. yeah. And that's why you get boring output from like these large, uh, general language models, because 
unfortunately, we're mostly boring people. But if you can train it, so what we can do with our AI is we actually train it on your brand voice. We take in all of your language, a brand's language, and whether or not you actually understand the frame and how you actually communicate, like somewhere embedded in your language is a frame. And what yeah. that happens, so when you train, when we train our AI on your brand, your brand language, it produces your brand frame and it, you know, and it's interesting versus just general unframed boringness. Sure. That's interesting. Um, I was on a, a webinar this week, somebody talking about AI and um, they said what AI can't, one of the couple of things AI has a really hard time doing is tension in advertising and mm -hmm. copy and things like that. You know, the unresolved open loops that are so effective in an ad and things like that. And it, and it, I hadn't thought of it this way, but it's, he said, because one, it's logical, but two, its job is to finish the job quickly mm -hmm. and tension and pacing and all the things that make an ad great, the illogical jumps that make an ad great, the twists that make an ad great are the opposite of what chat GTP is supposed to do, which is get you the data quickly, efficiently, yep. and get the job done. Yes. And that's, I mean, that's the, you've, you've absolutely nailed it. Like a great ad is basically an unexpected metaphor. Like yeah. it's a, a flip <laughs> where it's like, Oh shit. I never thought about my cheese as a girlfriend. That's super clever. It's like a, it's like a good comedian, right? right. It's all, totally. always that's the, mis yeah. the misdirection. It's the misdirection. It's like, it's taking how you feel about one thing and going like, yeah, it's kind of like this. And you're like, holy crap, I didn't see that connection. And that's exactly what it can't make because those are new and different. And all AI can do is repackage what is already exists, what already sure. exists. Yeah. <clears throat> can you train it to do that? Are you figuring you know, that out? You know, that's, that is the hardest. That's basically um, <clears throat> what they say about AI is in general, the hardest things to figure out how to do are the things that are easiest for humans and like um, unconscious for humans. And so framing, like we were saying, you know how we were saying like your narrative identity, like it's invisible to you. It's really hard for robots and AI to like pick up a glass of water and manipulate things with our fingers that are super easy for us. Mm -hmm. It's easy, it's really hard to make a robot do that. And it's really hard for AI to make metaphorical leaps because metaphor is like, that's the root of ideas. And so it's a difference between communication and having ideas and advertising and marketing is the idea figuring out how to express that idea is a second step that um you know that's why we're writers or designers or whatever but having the idea that's a very human thing that's that's going to be the last thing that ai conquers yeah because ai i mean ai's got a a set of parameters that mm -hmm. it works within right i mean and you know what we call, you know, in copywriting where you say, you know, pattern interruption or marketing yeah. where, you know, a good marketer is a, you know, is going to interrupt your thinking, right. Or break you out of that coma. Mm -hmm. I don't trust AI to do that. Right. No. Right. Because it's, 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 it's built with certain parameters that we give it. And those parameters typically are the ones that kind of keep us in the coma. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, they don't yeah. break us out of it. So that's exactly now that you said pan, pattern interruption, that's exactly it. The great yeah. thing that, that AI can do is surface those patterns for you. Right. Mm -hmm. But then you have to figure out how to interrupt those patterns. Yeah. Like another thing, tactically, kind of like uh, that whole idea of finding the frame within the industry is kind of a strategic thing. But tactically, you know, one of the one of the tricks that I would do is for writing headlines is um, just pop unexpected things into cliches and like movie quotes that we all know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you just, you're like, okay. And again, like I'll go back to, and I know it's dumb. Oh no, I'll, actually I'll use an example of from Tofurky for instance. So the way we came about the idea for, uh, that we had for Tofurky is the friendliest food on the plate. Like it's just the good guy. Like I had a friend, um, who actually I worked with him and, 
he was just like this, you know, he could be sitting here and you're like, oh my God, that's a really, like, I like that guy. He's just a super nice guy. And then one day uh, someone came into work and they're like, oh, I saw uh, Mike. He was serving food to homeless people underneath the bridge in Portland. I'm like, what? <laughs> like that, I, okay, I didn't have that, but wow, I like him even more now. Yeah, like he's just, right. Mike was just good. Like no matter what you're doing, like he's funny. He wasn't judgmental. Like he just rolled with everything. He could hang out and be fun. He wouldn't yeah. talk. He wouldn't preach. He wouldn't be like, you know, I never even knew he actually did that. But then when you find it out, you're like, oh yeah, that's Mike. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Right. And so yeah. basically I had writers, uh, our writers just write a whole bunch of headlines for Tofurky to figure out the brand. And one of the writers wrote a headline and it said, uh, makes, must makes mustard want to be a better condiment. <laughs> that's awesome and i was like that's it that's it because food is kind of like mike yeah like tofurkey is like it's it's yummy but it's not preachy like i don't have to eat it i don't feel like i need it. like i just eat it because it's good and then i can feel sure. also good yeah because like it doesn't you know it's not killing anything or whatever so like that's the kind of food i want tofurkey to be and so we just kind of went okay how do you talk about people how to talk about how your, your friends that you really like. And so we just made a whole bunch of headlines like, uh, you know, I have one mashed potatoes considers, considers it a mentor coleslaw's better half, like all these different ways that, you know, you talk about people you like. Well, it's also, what's, um, what's it called? Um, you're giving something inanimate, a human quality, totally. you know, uh, yeah. whether it's, yeah. an, I guess you call it animation, but also transubstantiation is a word. I yeah. Of. And so like the idea of makes mustard want to be a better condiment that comes, that's a movie quote from, uh, what's that movie? Yeah. The Jack Nicholas and yeah. um, Helen Hunt. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, as good as it gets. Yeah. As good as it gets. Right. Yeah, I, I remember so, that as soon as you said it, that's the scene that went through my head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so basically you can say like, give me a whole bunch of movie quotes about friendship. Mm, and then you just yeah. plug in yeah. cheese, you plug in a shoe right. and you just keep doing it until something pops. Cause that's what I would do you know, before AI or even before the internet, I just lay there on the couch and I'm like, what are some cliches I know and see if I can pop in, you know, randomness and create something interesting. It's interesting yeah. you say that because probably 10 years ago, I was, that's when I was writing a lot more financial copy and doing stuff like that for financial newsletter industry. I would actually, that's what I would do. I'd grab my Bartlett's book of quotations and I would turn to, kind of whatever stock pick we were going to end up with, like whatever category that was in, whether it's food or something else, I would, this one was actually a food promo that I'm thinking of. Um, and I came across a quote that said, uh, it was an old Spanish proverb that said civilization and anarchy are seven meals apart. And I was like, mm -hmm. that's it. Like, so I, I ended up titling the, the headline was like 56 hours to anarchy. Right. So the food, <laughs> and the whole thing was like the food supply getting disrupted and, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, those, those old quotes, man, they're, they stick around for a reason. Like, like totally. you were saying, the cliches, um, it, it, it spit out some of these, I got, um, going back in the show a little bit here. Like we said, what are some metaphors and cliches about food? Mm -hmm. Um, and it gave, you know, 15 right off the, the top you know life is yeah. like a box of chocolates uh, mm -hmm. icing on a cake biting off more than you can chew uh, piece of cake that's the way mm -hmm. cookie crumbles cherry on top yep um, yeah so so back in my head writing head uh, headline writing days i would say biting off more than you can chew i would take out biting and chew yeah. and i'd say blanking off more than you can blank <laughs> there's yeah. something funny there yeah right like i could find something and you just keep switching out the words, like search, switching out the nouns until you hit the right relationship. And you're like, yes, that's the relationship between those two things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. And so that's, what's great about GPT. Like, you know, chat GPT is you're like, give me more, give me 10 more cliches. Give me 10 yeah, more. Yeah, Cause I mean, it would take me hours and I probably wouldn't have come up with all these, even though I know all these, like they're all familiar to me. Totally. Sure. That but was the skill. To for that me was to the, generate those and sit down with a pen and paper or computer mm -hmm, like would take mm -hmm. hours for me to remember these you know i'd probably yeah, do better to go on yeah. a walk and try to capture them on a walk but right yeah. um, but even then I, I wouldn't get 15 in 15 seconds <laughs> yeah 
So, exactly. Yeah. And so that's how you like, you can use these to flip the script mm -hmm. because it, you set up, because it's a relationship like biting off more than you can chew has all this like meaning that comes to us because we've lived with it for so long. And then you can attach all that meaning to some new thing that you're writing about, like stock quotes or whatever, by just mm -hmm. changing some words. Yeah. And all of a sudden you create this new meaning. So like chat GPT can't create that new meaning. You have to create that meaning, but you have to use, you can use chat GPT to quickly unearth all the meaning that's already sitting in our brains. Right. Yeah. So what was interesting about this, if you're, if you're listening on the podcast and you're not watching the video, every cliche that it gave us, it also gave us the translation of that. Yeah. Cliche. The meaning behind it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you can, so yeah. for instance, biting off more you, than you can chew. Mm -hmm. It also gave us taking on more responsibility or tasks than one can handle. So it gave us a description mm -hmm. so you can really understand, you know, if you're not right. familiar with the cliche it, <laughs> and I didn't even ask it for that. It just provided yeah. that. And so with um, like with campaigns, if you think of like doing a campaign or like anything where you're doing, talking long term about the same product, um, a, a narrative, going back to that Tofurky thing, like the the best thing is when you have like a really good fitting metaphor. Like when you say like, OK, food or like people like bacon is like that one night stand, you know, you shouldn't do like. I'm really attracted to you, but man, you are not someone I want to marry. Yeah. That's, that's bacon. Right. <laughs> and so you can, you can go through and attach all the different connections between all the different foods, you know, tofu, you know, that wobbly tofu you buy, like, yeah, that's the person you should marry, but ooh, I don't, <laughs> uh, I like you as a friend. Right. This, this is starting to sound like a Seinfeld episode. <laughs> right. exactly. But that's when you know you have a really good idea is like it's a oh, really, absolutely. it's a really tight fitting metaphor. And that's mm -hmm. the thing like you can use chat GPT to uncover all those metaphors. And then you're like, oh, you can just keep extending that. So then you're like, tell me 10 more metaphors, mm -hmm. you know, that we do this and just constantly like find different ways to spin that. Sure. So once you land on that, have you? You said earlier you really can't get it to fill in the you, like biting off more than you can chew, blanking off more than you can blank. Mm -hmm. You haven't been able to get AI to spit that out very well. You got to have your people do that. Yeah, that's where you have to be like, okay, there, there we go, people. And that's where, like, for instance, but if you, you know, got going, like five of those from your people, could you then train it to do more of those, or would it just fall flat? You know, that's a good to? question. I would say so. There's a difference between. Um, and this is one of those kind of misperceptions about AI is that everyone thinks, oh, open AI, it's the largest language model ever created by humans. So therefore it must be the best. That's not true at all. What's actually the best, just like people, like very specialized people, you know, you run into people who are a certain flavor, like mm -hmm. the, you know, some of the best people that, that for me personally, who I like you know, I have a, one of my best friends one day, he walked into um, a party and he's like, garlic salt, that is gourmet <laughs> shit. And that was it. And he walked away and I'm like, what, the, what does he mean? I have to know now. I have to go ask. Like yeah. people who like have very strong opinions and know what they believe and know what they don't believe. Those are the people that are most attractive to us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't, I don't have an opinion about garlic salt, but all of a sudden I've been handed an opinion and I'm like, Ooh, I need to know more about this. I might reject it, but I appreciate, yeah. I respect someone who has an opinion about garlic salt. Chat GPT is like that person at a party who's like, Oh yeah, no, I like that too. And I'm the kind of like, they're the mushy middle person where you're like, ah. <laughs> yeah, where do you want to go eat? Oh, wherever's fine. Yeah. <laughs> wherever's fine. Whatever's fine. Exactly. It's okay. Like, <clears throat> That, but what I want with specialized language models, you can actually train to be opinionated. And so right. that's where after the, all the hype, we're living in this like miasma of hype about chat GPT mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and those products. What's going to happen in the end, just like, like, you know, the original dot com boom or any, any hype cycle, there's tons of hype about hype because of one thing. But then you quickly realize that it's not the big thing. There's going to be a whole bunch of small things later. And so what's going to happen later is there's going to be a whole bunch of small, specialized language models specifically about things. 
Yeah, and those specific are going to be to those industries or specific yeah. to those areas of well, uh, yeah, expertise. I'm, I'm even seeing talk about like uh, single use apps that yeah. Yeah, will be created. Oh, really yeah, totally. One, one transaction type apps, which is, yeah. I can't even wrap my head around it exactly. But when I read it, I was like, I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds like that's probably true. Because if, yeah. because if it doesn't require, you know, if it requires seconds, you know, it's not like it requires a team of people to develop and do all this stuff, then it makes sure. sense that you could, you know, create a code that is spitting off these one, you know, yeah. one use apps. Right. Chat, chat GPT is kind of like um, Elon Musk. It knows a lot about a lot of things. But if I want to write copy about a snowboard, I would rather have Sean White do that. Like Sean White's not as yeah. brilliant as, as uh, Elon Musk about a lot of things, but he knows sure. the, the F about snowboards. Yeah, yeah. He, he understands different grains of snow and different textures of snow right. and and he can speak the language and he knows exactly what you want to hear exactly yeah he knows what it feels like to be 10 feet above the half pipe or like you know that that even you know a professional copywriter is not going to go know because they haven't experienced it the way yeah, he right. has you know visceral experience yeah and that's so that's the hard thing like uh with adidas for instance going back to adidas and like product storytelling the problem that I always had with being the, the writing director of Adidas is because you have all these different kind of categories. You have trail runners, you have European football players, you have basketball players, you have cricket players. They all speak differently about their sports. They have different language. They care about different things. Sure. They don't want to hear things like they don't like tech basketball players don't really care about technology. Runners really care about technology. So it was really hard to talk to these different segments authentically. You had to you know, hire kind of subject matter experts or category experts to write about these things. And with the AI, when you train the AI, actually the AI can be experts, you know, help and kind of use that language, but you also need the, the writers to come in and kind of put that finishing human touch on there too. Sure, yeah. Yeah, That's so those listening, like this is, this is the, like, I'm just reminded of the amount of work required <laughs> to really nail a brand message, uh, yeah. especially a big brand, you know, that, and that's one oh. reason a lot of marketing books tell you to, to start with a small niche because then you can focus on that one thing. Whereas, you know, if you're Adidas or Nike, like you're saying, Brian, you gotta, you gotta appeal to the full spectrum yeah. in one tagline. Yeah. And that's, that's a big task. Yeah. You have to be with the, the, another question I always ask, uh, are you always used to ask customers when I was doing consulting kind of story consulting was, you know, what your product is for, but what is it about? Mm -hmm. mm. Like Patagonia makes products for outdoor sports, but it's about saving the earth. Sure. Yeah. So most companies know that's like the biggest missing element is most companies know what their products are for, but they don't actually know what they're about because they're not about anything. Right. They're like, we know, we know what we're about. We're about like awesome days out on the, you know, out on the snow. And you're like, no, every, every company's about that. Sure. Every outdoor company is about getting outdoors. So who do you think has done that? Well, as an example, Oh God, there's, um, uh, Oh God, what, what's it called? Hold on. Uh, liquid death. Oh yes. The water, the new, they kill it. Lego kills it. Lego's the best brand in the, in the world. Interesting. Why do you say that? Uh, yeah. Explain. I mean, because I know I've spent thousands of dollars on Lego cause I had a, had a I know. toy. And, yeah. And, uh, Lego is fun. Star Wars Legos especially. Yeah. <laughs> Lego is fun. So they're not like, they don't talk about fun. They never talk about like, we're fun. They never mm -hmm. say that. It's always, it's just, yeah, they're fun. Yeah. But Lego is about like uh, using fun to help grow great people. Like, you know, they sure. have, it's all about learning and building. And so they have, the thing that I love about Lego is that there's no curtain. You know how there's, um, in most brands, there's like the curtain, like here's the show we put on, here's what we say, mm -hmm. but then here's actually like behind the curtain, 
we're this and we don't and so like you know i would say that nike was kind of the maybe the the beginner of that or the starting of that start of that where it's not like they want to have this show about being you know winning and everything but really they're trying to sell you this stuff the thing about lego is that it's all like lego movie you're like well i love the lego movie and you're like yeah and you're like well you also you're se- i mean it's like one big ad and you're like yeah <laughs> <laughs> right isn't that isn't that amazing right. Yeah. And you're like, it is amazing. I can't believe you just like, you're selling me, but I'm happy being sold because I believe in you because you're actually a good thing. And actually I believe that when you use Lego, it inspires creativity and like, it's all good. And you're like, yeah, it's all good. We're going to market to you again. Do you want to? And you're like, yeah, I would love to be marketed to you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. It's like, yeah. they're, they're like, yeah. they were Ryan Reynolds before Ryan Reynolds was Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. Well, it's it's like people want to be entertained first and foremost, right? Yeah. I mean, so I mean that's a great example. Lego has entertained people. Um, so you wanna you wanna educate your public, but you wanna entertain if you're boring, no no one cares, right? And so, Yeah. And if and if you know your mission, like if you know your purpose, like again, I go back to Patagonia, which you know, everyone not everyone loves Patagonia, but everyone respect. Right. Like it's like, oh yeah, you do a great job. Like there's no curtain. There's no in front of the curtain, behind the curtain. They're just like, yeah, we're here to save the earth. Right. And and then when you look at like when you read their brand manuals and you go and dig in, and so I use I use Patagonia a lot as a um, as an example of like living your story. Because most brands don't live the story they say they live. That's the mm-hmm. problem. Is like marketing is like the story you say you live, but then you live a different story because you have um, shareholders and you, the story you act, most brands actually live is we got to make money any way possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whereas Patagonia doesn't have to, so they just live their story. They're like, we've been doing, you know, they pay their, um, they pay to get out of jail if you protest, if any of their yeah. uh, employees protest. They teach um, nonviolent protest to any employee who wants to. Like they do all this stuff and you're like, oh man, the, the further you dig into Patagonia, the truer their story gets. Yeah. Yeah. The Whereas, book, uh, Let's Go Surfing was a great, great yeah. read. You, you got to start to get a glimpse of that. Yeah. So I'd say like Lego and, and, um, and Patagonia are two brands that live my personal uh uh, live the way I think brands should live, which is like, go ahead, come into our headquarters, our headquarters, that furniture in our headquarters will be a metaphor for what we believe in the universe. Yeah. Hmm. So like everything we do is just, be, it's because that's how that, again, going back to those, um, the, the people that you really are attracted to, like they're, they live out loud and they're like open and they're not like, they don't hide anything because like, this is it, buddy. If you, <laughs> if you like it, you like it. And if you don't, right. you don't. And that's that kind of, that whole, that, that mindset reminds me of like the movie, um, going back to that movie air where they're like, and I didn't, this is something that I learned. Like the NBA had, like, they had a rule about like, you could only have so much, you had to have a certain amount of white in your shoe back in the day. I don't know if this is still Mm -hmm. applicable, but um, they said that like 52% of the shoe had to be white. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they said, well, we'll just make it more red and we'll pay, you know, at the, you know, because if you violated that, the NBA was going to fine you, you know, several thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know what, we'll just, we'll make it more red and we'll just pay the fine. (laughs) How about that? You know, so it was like, we're going to get a better shoe. We're going to get people talking about that, but then we're also going to, uh, we're going to pay the fine for that. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, get people talking and, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So Brian, do you think that was them living their brand? Do you think that was them being a marketing company? No, I think that was them living their brand or, I mean, like they really lived. Oh yeah. They were, the whole rebel thing was exactly who they were. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's probably changed with, you know, management changes and things like that. Those, you can lose that, that thread. Oh, yeah. There was a moment, like having been a a competitor to Nike, there was a moment in time when they hired a whole bunch of uh, brand managers from Procter & Gamble 
Because sure. like once you become like there's challenger brands and there's leader brands, like once you mm -hmm. are the king of the kingdom, right. like then you stop challenging things and you start just putting out fires in the kingdom. You're like, oh, you know, someone's come up with a shoe <laughs> over here that does this. Let's go create a little right. shoe that, that competes against that. Like, and you just, you just keep the kingdom, sure. like you're the dominant player. So you just keep the kingdom happy. Mm -hmm. And so they yeah, hired a whole bunch of P and G talent to come in and like be like in, instill leadership uh, branding. And so all of a sudden they stopped having like really cool headlines and started just having like really, you know, shiny bodied, beautiful people. And like, it just went from meaning something to just being like aspirational. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like Apple made that transition uh, totally. when, went to Tim, from Steve Jobs to Tim Cook. Uh, and it worked, right? I mean, they're they're more profitable than ever. I yeah. saw today that um, on a chart that even though Samsung sells more smartphones than Apple, like pretty good bit more. I can't remember what the exact numbers were. Apple has eighty five percent of the of the profits in the smart of all smartphone business. They have eighty five percent wow. of the profit margins. Exactly. It's not about selling more products. It's about selling products profitably. Yeah which is, you know, Tim Cook was an operations guy, not a, not a creative genius like Steve sure. Jobs was. So yeah, yeah it's, and, and, and you can tell it like Apple has lost some of its soul. It doesn't have its fanboys that it has used to have, you know, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, you know, Jonathan and I have talked about this on the show. We, we own a whole slew of Apple products, like a lot mm -hmm. of people, but we're no longer passionate about them. Now we're like kind of <clears> stuck <throat> in the that, ecosystem. I, it's like, <laughs> I wrote a blog post that said like, I'm trapped, uh, I'm trapped in the Apple story. Like I can't get out. <laughs> yes. Like at yeah. first, at first their story of simplicity, like what, why the stuff, why the hell is stuff so complicated? You're like, yes. As a, as a creative, you know, when Apple was just emerging a young mm -hmm. creative, I was like, yes, why the hell is everything so complicated? Like design something, design computers for us creatives. And so I became a huge fan and I joked because in, especially like in that blog post, like my nieces all own iPhones. They don't know yeah. why, right? They don't know why it's just the dominant oh, thing. Now you, they've, they've changed, they basically changed behavior. And now we all demand simplicity in our, in our mm -hmm. software. So everything is now simple and Apple is the owner and the, the king of simple. And so now, like you're saying, like, I I'm sick and tired of spending $42 for a cord. That's <laughs> ludicrous. Yeah. Like yep. now I have to pay for all the peripherals and everything. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, if someone yeah. can come along and rescue me <laughs> from being trapped in this but frame, I can't, but I can't leave because if my texts go through with a different color than most of my <laughs> friends, what am I going to do? Right. You totally. know, like like yep. we all know the, the friend that has the, you know, the Samsung phone and they can't read your, emojis or gifts or yeah. whatever right. get yeah. facetime you know uh, yeah, yeah so it's I mean, painful that's why, to leave it's very yeah. painful <laughs> crazy yeah, exactly but, <laughs> but the passion is definitely gone yeah sure. yeah oh right. yeah we talk about the the you know those old school commercials where you know i'm a mac and i'm a pc i mean that was like those were oh amazing they flipped that now i mean samsung's now doing it back to them yeah Totally. Yeah. And, and it's, and it is, it's true. Samsung is much more innovative now yeah. than, than Apple. Oh yeah. You were going to say earlier, um, Brian, you mentioned liquid death. I'm curious, like why you, that was the one that came to mind. And for those uh, that don't know, liquid death is the new water <laughs> company on the block and their cans look like craft beer, like, mm -hmm. a, right. like, like right. almost like the rogue brand of craft beers. Yeah. So, they um, they did an amazing job of reframing. Mm -hmm. So there's at the core, so there's again, going back to like kind of like the way I think of things, there is three layers to storytelling kind of marketing. And it is um, at the core of it, there's your belief. And then you have to figure out how you always frame that belief everywhere you go. And that's like the metaphor that kind of makes that belief visible and then there's the delivery of it how do you deliver like and so the delivery is the only thing anyone ever sees is like you deliver it in terms of products and ads and pr and all that that's the delivery but inside of everything that you deliver you have to have this belief in a frame 
So to give you an example, like Nike believes that um, winning takes care of everything. Like they believe that um, there's winners and losers and Nike's a winner and everybody else are losers. And if you wear Nike, you're a winner. So the way they frame that is sport is conflict, sport is a war. So everywhere you looked, um, everything about Nike until about 2017 was like, it's about me beating you, you're number two, I'm number one. It's, and that's how they, and every single, they delivered all the time on that, on that frame. So Liquid Death, I like because they're really, um, A, the delivery, all this stuff is great, but the reason why it's great is A, it's creative. They find new and different ways of saying the same thing all the time, but their frame is uh, basically death to plastic. So they started out with a belief, which is like, why are we all drinking out of plastic bottles? What an insane thing, like it's not recyclable. Whereas aluminum, and it's a, it's, a, it's a simple premise, but it makes it feel good that this belief that like, well, why don't we just like, let's save the earth and switch to aluminum cans. It's just such an easy thing. And so they framed it as like death to plastic. And so now everything is about death. <laughs> And they come up with such amazing ways to do it uh, over and over and over again. And it just drills it at home. And, and it, again, like I was saying with um, my nieces and me and Apple, like I believed in the message of simplicity, mm -hmm. but now it's like, now kind of they, Apple, like my nieces don't actually believe strongly in, app, in Apple. They don't know why they do it. And so with, with liquid death for instance like you can just keep making these jokes about death like you know you, you might say like well no one knows that's actually about death to plastic and i'm like yeah but the people that started like the people that started the thing yeah they know and they are cool like there's a whole way of marketing you market to the change makers at the front end and if you get the the opinion leaders at the front end to believe in something and like it then they go and they show up to parties with liquid death and their friends who look to them for inspiration see that they're drinking liquid death and they're like oh cool i'm gonna drink liquid death too because it's kind of cool yeah it does look like a, a beer, a beer yeah looks and like the, a, a cross between an energy drink a craft yeah. beer and another uh, like another sub insight to liquid death which i really like is that you know people are drinking less alcohol these days yeah and they didn't want to show up to a party and drink orange juice or, you know, spritzers or, or you know, other sure. water. Like they wanted to, you know, be proud of what was in their hand and not feel like they're wussy for not drinking yeah. alcohol. And so you come up with liquid death and you're like, yeah, I can feel, you know, proud and cool to hold this in my hand while I drink at the party without drinking alcohol. So it reminds me of like, do you remember, Sean, we had... Uh who was it we had? Was it Pete uh, from Pete's Wicked Ale? Yeah. Remember Pete Slosberg? So yeah. he had a line that I wrote down on a whiteboard when we interviewed him, but he's, he was the founder of Pete's Wicked Ale. He went out, I think he sold out to uh, Budweiser, mm -hmm. um, made a fortune off of that. So, um, but he, I think one of his sayings was uh, treat your product with, reverence but everything else with irreverence you know that was like his totally his motto his saying <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. everything else irreverence yeah so, so. so how does a company like liquid death how does that story evolve um you know because because once everybody knows what's in the can doesn't it lose some of its cool and how do you keep that that story do you have to do you stay to the same frames and the same core beliefs you just have to figure out new ways to present it or how does that evolve? No, you have to, yeah. You just have to keep in reinventing the, the delivery of it. Okay. Well, and, and some, of it's like the, some of it's like the, you know, the flavors, like what is it? Yeah, uh, death by. Mm -hmm. Now they have um, tea. Yeah. They're, they're so there is up. a, yeah, there is a way like in terms of like when you start to think of communication and the world in terms of metaphors and frames, there are nested frames, like within each big frame, like up is good. There's a whole bunch of subframes. Like, well, if you believe up is good, you also believe, or actually like it starts to expand out. So for instance, Apple, 
um, targeted creativity. And it was like, you know, early on with the whole like business people marching off and, um, you know, 1984 ad, 1984 ad, it was about like breaking out of like, um, it was targeted, totally targeted creative. So they talked to creatives first, mm -hmm. yeah. but a belief that all creatives have is that simplicity is actually, uh, what is it? Simpl simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Like that's yeah. the end result. Like they had that on their wall at the it's beginning. It's a Da Vinci quote, right? Right. It's a Da Vinci quote. So at first they targeted a smaller frame, but that, and so within your big frame of say Apple is simplicity, um, simplicity is power because back before Apple tech, like complexity was power. Like you were smart. If you had, if you were into computers, you were smart. And if you weren't into computers, you were dumb. If you could do, you know, computer things, you were smart and computers were complex and they're like, Oh, move aside. I'm the it department here. I can figure this out. I'm smart. You're dumb. So complexity, like the, the ability to deal with complexity was actually power. It was power. It made you feel powerful. Mm -hmm. And Apple came along and was like, F that, like complexity is for idiots and yeah. simplicity, like simplicity is actually elegance. And it's like a, another level of, of kind of social power. Sure. So it's the, so within you can, you can kind of, uh, operate within your frame, your, your big frame, there's lots of little frames. And so you can talk about creativity. You can talk about this. You can talk about that as long as it's within your frame, but if it's outside of your frame, you shouldn't talk about it. Sure. Interesting. Yeah. And there's so much there and we could talk for hours on this. Uh, you need to write a book, Brian, about all this stuff. <laughs> like I'm, I'm seeing Eventually. diagrams of, uh, yeah, I, got so, a, oh, yeah. I got a pyramid drawn here with like belief frame delivery. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so when I you will. meet with, you know, when you take on clients, I mean, kind of give us what the process is where, you know, you sit down with a company yeah, and you're obviously you're doing your, your kind of your fact finding or your, your research discovery. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, take us maybe from that point to, you know, the process of developing their, their own unique story. Yeah. Interesting. So, so, you know, I have to say like, I'm, I no longer do any of this consulting anymore. Like the, the agency, this, this narrative studio, the story mm -hmm. studio is running really well and successful, but I have nothing to do with it. I am now launching this, uh, the, the software system. So I actually don't okay. do this stuff anymore. This is just mm -hmm. fun for me. Sure. But when we did engage, the interesting thing is selling soft, like I am kind of more involved in selling software these days. Mm -hmm. And back when I uh, had this, the studio, I was actually anti-selling. I'm like, I don't sell. I actually try and get you not to work with us because I only want to work, you know, at the time I, I didn't have well, takeaway selling. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I would have this thing. I would, I would have this presentation and it was called how story works. Yeah. And so uh, companies would get a hold of us and they're like, Hey, we want to work with you. And we're like, okay, well, here's the thing I have to, I'll come out I'll fly out to your headquarters and I'll give you this talk about how story works. And if you believe in this talk, then we can work together. But if you don't believe in the talk, it's going to be a terrible relationship and we shouldn't work together. Mm -hmm. And that alone was such an amazing sales tool that I would, <laughs> I would recommend to everyone to aggressively not want to work with people <laughs> to get them to want to work with you. No, I mean, I believe it. That's to me, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, influence there. People, yeah, it's, it's like that scarcity. You want what you can't have. Right. I mean, totally. Yeah. And, and it was, and it was true. There's tons of, I mean, like the reason it started that way is because I started out as a freelancer <laughs> when I left mm -hmm. Adidas and yeah. I kept working for companies that were like just crazy and they would want, like, right. they were all over the place. They like, I would get this product and I'm like, well, this thing's broken on a level that I can't fix with a headline. Yeah. Like it's just never going to sell. I'm like, okay, but I'll work with you. But, and it just didn't work well. So I wanted to figure out the difference. And that's where I came upon this. I'm like, well, what makes powerful products? What mm -hmm. makes powerful advertising? Well, it's powerful products. What makes powerful products? Powerful cultures. Cultures are organized in certain ways. 
And so I got to this kind of like in trying to work backwards to just find better clients. I got to this whole methodology of how things should be. And it is really like companies have to be on a, like they have to live a story. It's not necessarily about a purpose. It's about just having a belief. Like Supreme has a belief, but they have no purpose. Right. Buddhism, which is, you know, one of the largest uh, religions in the world, the belief in re- of, of Buddhism is that there's no purpose in life. Brands keep talking about purposes and it's not about purposes. We all have beliefs. Not all of us have purposes. Hmm. Right. So you have to find that belief and you find it by digging back through like the reason why they can engage me and pay the money that I charge is because someone somewhere had a really great idea. Mm-hmm. And if you had a really great idea, you also had a really great frame and there's something already there. So we would just climb, like we would interview people in the company and listen to where it started, what they like to work, why they like to work there, what's their proudest sure. moments. And in those stories, you uncover the frame and then you compare that against the dominant frame of the in- industry. And you're like, oh, here's the difference. You're like this, but you've all, because you're struggling right now, you're chasing after this frame that you're actually don't, n- none of you believe in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so wow. you basically, it's like a therapist, a mm-hmm. com- like a corporate therapist. You're like, so here's your story. Here's where you, here's why you were founded. Here's why you all work here. And they're like, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's interesting, and it's it's interesting. I guess as management changes, as you know, you move from founder, or as you know, you got to make payroll. Like you can start to lose the beliefs and the, the sure. Or that's exactly it. anyway. Every company who has lost their beliefs did it because they had to start chasing money. Yeah. As soon as you start chasing money, everybody chases money. That's what sets Lego. Like if you look at Lego and IKEA and these companies, these dominant companies most of them are still privately owned patagonia still privately owned Lego privately owned so that's interesting do you think they start losing their way when they go public you know because they got shareholders to i mean they're responsible too so yes two things that make them lose their way is they lose their founder and they lose and they go public they go they because if you instill like you don't need a founder you need a good culture a founder sets a culture So once the culture is set, like, again, with my writing studio, like I don't do anything and it still grows like crazy. The reason why is because I set a good cult. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the person saying this, so take it with a grain of salt, but like, I think they would tell you that I set up a good culture and I know the guardrails, like, here's what we do. Here's what we don't do. Here are the things that we sometimes do. Mm -hmm. And so everyone knows what they're about. That's where like Lego, you don't have to have a, founder but what happens is when you go public and then you lose your founder no one can take the place of that founder then the then the shareholders take the place of that founder right, and the, the ceo share, yeah or the founder becomes uh, you know he's answering to the shareholders he may be you know by proxy he may still be in the position of president but he's answering to those shareholders and yeah ex- you know, they're, they're expecting certain things right i mean as soon as people start chasing exits right. and um, chasing shareholder value, then yeah. you can't do this. Because the thing about the thing about good branding is it's not about what you'll do for your customers; it's what you'll never do. That's right. the one of the things. Yeah. Like that's why, like for instance, with Patagonia, the that ad "Don't buy this jacket." The most one of the most iconic ads in all of advertising history because it talks about what they won't do for money. Yeah. Is that, was that the title of it? Don't buy this jacket. I mean, was that a headline? Yeah. Uh, So don't don't buy this jacket. See, to me, that's great. Cause that's like pattern. That's classic pattern interruption. I was like, what, what are Mm -hmm. you doing? (laughs) Everybody wants to know what you won't do for money. Like what is it? What? Because (laughs) that's a good one there. Yeah. Um, well, we want to be respectful of your time, Brian. This has been fascinating. Like I said, we could probably Absolutely. talk for hours, but, um, yeah. anything you want to say about Talkoot and kind of Talkoot, however we want to say, it, whatever, however Talkoot. we decide to say it, Talkoot, Talkoot. Yeah. um, anybody that might be listening that, you know, e-com like, who, you know, who's mm-hmm. a good fit and where can they learn more? Yeah. I mean, the, again, going against 
type and stuff. Like when you look at AI, most of most um, software about marketing is about scaling crap. It's about putting more crap out into the world. And so when you come to AI and like, that's where I go with GPT through, you know, chat GPT and stuff like that. If you want to generate 10,000 pieces of crappy product copy to put on Amazon to get, you know, your 0.01% sell through by drop shipping, you know, uh, plastic tweezers to the world, don't use Talkoot. <laughs> right. If you actually have a valuable product and a brand, and if you have a valuable brand, you actually have a valuable language. And if you want to actually put something valuable into the world for consumers and connect with consumers, you know, on every little detail page, look at Talkoot because Talkoot uh, is actually the company that, or the, the software that can do that. Because I, you know, that's that's who's going to win in the end. I think you're right. I think that <clears throat> I think there's always a reaction or a response to technology, and you're seeing with you know one of the things that I see was you know everybody, so many people despairing, you know, artificial intelligence and where it's going is going to take jobs. Um, but I actually see it as a flip side. I think there's opportunities there. And I think there's opportunities mm -hmm. for entrepreneurs who want to get back to uh, really honing the craft, you know, craftsmanship mm -hmm. and, you know, really creating good products, like yeah. really good products, like not just like, you know, creating a bunch of crap, but creating really good stuff. And, yeah. you know, from a craftsmanship mentality. And I think that's where, um, you know, uh, you know, there's always a reaction, but I think that's where companies like, mm -hmm. you know, Taku, um, you know, companies like that can really thrive because they're, you know, they're telling the story of companies mm -hmm. that are really unique and that they are creating good stuff mm -hmm. um, and not just, you know, creating a bunch of stuff out there that is what we're used to is buying from China <laughs> or yeah. you know, just like off the assembly line, you know, so to speak. Right. Yeah, if you think of like um, a good example, like with, with software, you can divide software into two different things. Yeah. So, there's software that uh, we can put in between humans to separate yeah. us so mm -hmm. we don't have to bother with different humans. Like Amazon is all about that, like yeah. replacing humans everywhere you can go so you never have to interact with a human again. Then the other part of software or the other side of software is removing all the bull crap so we can actually engage more with humans in the things right. that we actually really love. Sure. We don't have to do all the boring interaction. We can actually just have great interactions. And so there's like direct to consumer brands. One that I always mention that comes to mind is Tracksmith. It's a running brand. As a runner, I'm a runner. When I go to the Tracksmith website, I'm like, yes, you mm -hmm. totally get me. Like you use all the right words and all the right imagery. Like you totally understand me. Yeah. They have a they have a whole tech stack behind that to get rid of all the crap that I have to deal with when I <laughs> buy, so that I can actually connect with the with the experience and have a great experience. Whereas Amazon gets rid of all the stuff, so I never have to interact with a single human being. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Cool. Very cool. All right, man. There's there's a lot of good stuff in there. I would suggest people go back and listen. There's a lot of gold nuggets to unpack and play with and ponder on your walk or your next run. Um, yeah. In whatever shoe you choose. <laughs> uh, but yeah. yeah. Are you a Phil Knight fan? <laughs> no. <laughs> I will say that was one of the, I have to say the shoe dog was one of the best business biographies I think I'd ever read. Yeah, I mean, there, the, there, way it was, there, the way it was written. Was just yeah, really there, there are parts I really do appreciate. I appreciate the rebel, the being the challenger. Like, I really, that sure. resonates with me. There are lots of things, though, that I just, like, the winning takes care of everything. That comes right from him. Yeah. Like, okay. anything, anything to win. And I just can't, I don't abide yeah. by that. Yeah. You seem a little more laid back than that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so. cool. Which strikes me as... You know, I can see that. I guess I can see that from him, but I also see the guy that is the, uh, you know, portrayed as the guy that never wear. He's not wearing shoes in the office. He's barefoot and you know. totally love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 
Yeah, but that, that's also part of the the culture from that your exactly. part of the country. You know, that's right. Exactly. Absolutely. The coastal, the outdoorsy, oh, yeah. all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, John, I'll right. let you wrap it up. Um, yeah, Brian, it's yeah. been a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. We've been, really enjoyed the conversation. Um, we want to let you know. Obviously, our listeners know where they can find it's it's Takut dot com right yep that's yep. it talkout.com and uh, we'll be sh- posting a link on our show page and uh and we appreciate it we'll um we'll let you uh retire if you don't mind maybe for uh, like a minute uh, to our green room and uh, sean and i will wrap up the show and then we'll come back and uh talk to you uh, on the back end all right take care everybody all right thanks thanks so much that's great, man. Fantastic. I have some gold nuggets in that one for sure. Like, That's right. I've got some notes and some one liners yeah. and everything else. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Brian yeah, definitely needs to write a book. book. <laughs> I know. I know. I was thinking that myself, you know, jotting down a bunch of notes and like, yeah, I could see a book out of this for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, that whole, that whole three layers of storytelling belief, uh, mm-hmm. framing belief and delivery belief. That's, that's a book. So yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, hopefully somebody doesn't steal it before you do, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Uh, to all of our listeners, you can find us over at persuasion by the pint.com. You can find us on all of your podcast platforms, Stitcher radio, iHeart, Spotify, you name it. And uh, it's been fun. We've enjoyed this. Uh, we'll make the, this is episode three Oh five. So four, right? um, three or four. Oh, three or four. Yeah. I'm jumping yep. ahead there. Um, yeah. So, Man, it's good stuff. But uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next time, next week on the uh, on the show. And uh, Sean, have a great weekend. See ya. All right. <laughs>